Welcome to Speaking Opera. My name is Howard Hart, and I will be your host today in a conversation with Ward Marston. Ward is the archivist and restoration producer, as well as owner of Marston Records. You've just heard the glorious voice of Lottie Lehman singing Elsa's Dream from Richard Wagner's Lohengrin. We will return at the end of the program to listen to the complete aria. My conversation with Ward begins with the question, were there any unusual challenges specific to your work on the upcoming release of Lottie Lehman's Odeon Electric Recordings 1927 to 1933. Let us listen to that portion of the conversation now. Were there any unusual challenges specific to your work on the upcoming release of the Lottie Lehman's Odeon Electric Recordings that you could tell us about? Well, the interesting thing about the projects that we do is that there are always challenges and that the, the challenges are never the same kinds of challenges. Every project has its own specific ones. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this project um, and let me go back to a uh, previous project because about three years ago, we issued our first uh, CD set of Lotta Lehmann's early recordings. And we issued a, it's a four CD set of her early uh, recordings for the gramophone, uh, for Deutsche Gramophone and for Odeon. And these recordings went from 1916 to 1926. And uh, in 1926, the Odeon company switched over from acoustic recording to electric recording. Now, I don't know how many of your listeners know the difference, but the uh, acoustic recording system was the, the old system of recording that started back in the 19th century with Thomas Edison. And it involved uh, performing or speaking or singing into a kind of a megaphone or horn. And the sound that you made uh, was mechanically transmitted through the horn to a uh, vibrating to a diaphragm that would vibrate and that diaphragm would actually uh, then uh, transfer the vibrations to a cutting needle which would cut grooves in either a wax cylinder or a wax disc and uh, that is the way that acoustic recordings were made up to the mid 1920s and then um, because of the work that Bell Telephone Laboratories was doing in this country, uh, they developed the first electrical recording system. And um, Victor, in this country, in Colombia, began using electrical recording in 1925. Um, but some other companies were a little bit slower to, to make the change to electric recording because it was very expensive. Um, anybody who wanted to make electric recordings using the Bell system had to license it from the Bell system. And so it was quite expensive. In any case, Odeon uh, switched over in the fall of 1926. And Lotta Lehman continued to record for the Odeon company from 1927 when her first electrics were made, her first electric records were made in this winter of 27. And, uh, and actually in February of 27, and she concluded her contract with Odeon in 1933. So the set that we are just about to release is a six CD set that contains all of Lehman's electrical recordings made for the Odeon company. It's about 120 sides. And uh, the challenges, uh, getting back to your question, uh, Howard, the challenges involve, first of all, just finding all of the records. That is always a big challenge. Um, I have a very large collection, and I also know many, many collectors all over the world. But it's not always easy to find uh, excellent condition copies of these records. These records have been around for almost 100 years. And uh, if they were, if 
you know, copies of the records were played too much, um, they get scratched or they get worn out and they sound terrible. So you have to find copies of the records that were not played uh, very much. And that's not always easy to do. Fortunately, most of Lehman's Odeon recordings are quite um, common. She was a very popular star in Germany and in Austria and also in England. And so her records were not only issued on the German Odeon label, but they were picked up by English Parlophone and they were issued in England on the Parlophone label, not all of them, but many of them. And then in America, some of them were issued over here in America on Columbia and later on the United States, the U.S. DECA label, American DECA label. And so many of her records are exceedingly easy to find, but finding them in good condition is not always as so easy as one might think. And then there is the problem of finding those last few records that are very rare. And uh, it turns out that so uh, several of the sides recorded by Odeon um, are exceedingly rare. And I was only able to locate one uh, collector in Austria who had a copy of this one particular record. So we're very, very fortunate to be able to include all of her electric records on this uh, six CD set. The other challenge is just getting them to sound good. Um, Odeon, uh, during 1927 and 28, used, their, used the uh, Bell system, um, which was actually marketed by Western Electric. Um, and so it's often referred to as the Western Electric system or the Westrex system. And uh, then in 1929, um, Odeon began to use their own system, I guess, to save money. Um, conditions in Germany at the time were, were far from ideal in terms of uh, the economic conditions in Germany. And uh, the company needed to save as much money as possible. And they developed their own system of recording, which was not as satisfactory as the uh, Western electric system. And so making some of these late uh, Odeon recordings made between 1929 and 33, making them sound uh, as good as the earlier ones uh, was quite a challenge. And uh, it's impossible actually to make them sound as good. But the wonderful thing about all of these records is that Lehman had such a natural gift for being able to uh, sing uh, specifically for the for recording, and to and to she could really put things over on recordings. You you can you actually can sense her acting uh, on these records. You don't have to see her. You know you can hear it. You can hear how she is acting as she's singing. And this is not only in operatic arias, but in leader and in songs and 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 so on. So. It's really a wonderful set, and I'm hoping that uh, some of your listeners will decide that they would like to purchase the set from us. And we are um, Marston Records, and our website is marstonrecords.com, M-A-R-S-T-O-N-R-E-C-O-R-D-S.com. And you can go on to our website, and you can purchase um, anything from our back catalog, as well as the Lehman issue, uh, which will be available sometime in early October. Ward and I discussed the many avenues in his journey in music. I suggested you give us a brief overview, which we will hear now. As I mentioned earlier, I started listening to old records at a very young age, and my ear became attuned to those old voices. But I also was studying piano at the same time and also was gaining interest in current singers as, as, as well. So I was listening to stereo recordings of 
of operas, and I was attending operas in Philadelphia, and occasionally in, lucky enough to attend operas in New York. And uh, so it was only natural uh, that I begin to do something with all of this interest that I had, especially with old singers. And um, I also had interest in in the technical aspect of how recordings were made and so on. And uh, so I, I was given a tape recorder at a very early age. And I used to spend hours and hours recording my old records onto tape when I was in my teens. And when I was in college at Williams College in, in Massachusetts, I was got involved with the Williams College radio station, WCFM. And I had a classical music program several times a week that I did. And uh, I was given free reign to play whatever I wanted. And I decided very quickly that I wanted to, I wanted to play uh, not only uh, stereo recordings that we had in our radio station library, but that I would like to play my own 78 RPM recordings. I had brought a great many of my 78s up to school with me. And uh, at the radio station, we had a very good turntable. And in those days, uh, we even had a, a, a 78 setup to be able to play 78s. Uh, so I began playing historic recordings on the air in the 1970s, early 70s. And from there, uh, I began to think about actually pursuing a career in uh, doing audio engineering work. And I began by making my own, did my own uh, analog uh, transfers of orchestral sets. Um, I, I was particularly interested in the recordings that Leopold Stokowski had made with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And in 1974, I went to the local Philadelphia NPR affiliate, which was then called WUHY, now it's WHYY, and asked them if I could produce a series of radio programs featuring Leopold Stokowski's 78 RPM recordings with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And to my great joy and astonishment, really, because I was only 22 years old, they said, sure, uh, do it, and we'd love to air it. When I was a student at Williams College, I was involved with the radio station there, WCFM, and I began to play classical recordings uh, from my 78 RPM collection on the air. Now, you must realize that if you want to play a symphony, for example, you have to find a way to uh, put all of the sides together. Uh, a symphony, let's say a Brahms symphony, would be typically recorded on 10 sides. Uh, and uh, when they recorded it, the orchestra would stop at the end of a four-minute side and they would start again uh, at the beginning, at the same spot when the, uh, the new record was put on to the, the turntable to be recorded. And so in order to make a continuous performance, you have to link all of the sides or join all of the sides together. Well, I had figured out a very, a very cool way of doing it uh, so that there was the, the joins were actually quite undetectable. I must say I was quite proud of myself about this. And I played a lot of historic recordings on, uh, on the air. Uh, at college, mostly I was interested at the time, mostly in symphonic uh, recordings. So I played a lot of recordings by Stokowski and Philadelphia Orchestra. I played a lot of recordings by the Willem Mengelberg and the New York Philharmonic. I played some Toscanini records, all sorts of symphonic uh, things. And I did play some operatic recordings. I can remember uh, one program that I did, um, which received a uh, a lot of interest from the students and faculty was I played the 1931 recording of Gounod's Faust uh, featuring Marcel Journet, ah, yes. which was one of my, at the time, it was one of my favorite operatic recordings. 
And I spent a great deal of time joining all of the 40 sides together and making a, a whole a composite of the entire performance and playing it on the air. Well, this led to uh, my thinking that somehow I might actually pursue this as a career. I, I didn't really know whether I was going to try to get into radio or what I was going to do, but I did contact the National Public Radio affiliate in Philadelphia, WHYY. Actually, in those days, it was called WUHY. Anyway, I proposed um, an idea to them that I produce a series of programs on Stokowski's recordings with the Philadelphia Orchestra. By that time, I had managed to collect all of the recordings which Stokey had made with the orchestra, and uh, I was prepared to produce a major series. Well, to my joy and astonishment, because I was 22 years old, they accepted my offer and agreed to let me do it. And so I produced a 58 week, it was a, uh, each program was one hour, and I produced 58 programs covering the entire uh, spectrum or the, you know, the entire output. Uh, of Stokowski's recordings with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And this was broadcast from uh, September of 1974 to November of 1975. And then after that, I uh, actually received uh, a call from uh, an, an A&R uh, producer at uh, Columbia Records whose name was Peter Munvies. I know Peter. And Peter had yeah. heard about me, yeah. and uh, I met him, and he decided uh, to ask me to do a set of Budapest String Quartet historic recordings uh, for the Columbia label. And that was my first uh, venture into commercial uh, reissues of historic recordings. So I was very fortunate. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I did this Budapest String Quartet uh, reissue in 1976. From there on, I did uh, recordings. I did uh, uh, engineering work for the International Piano Archive. I produced some recordings, uh, some reissues for the Bell Telephone Laboratory. And then from then on, I went to the Franklin Mint. And uh, they had a, a number of uh, recording series that they were doing. And I became their uh, recording engineer producer. And uh, for a number of years, I worked for the Franklin Mint. And then after that, I uh, worked for, did a good deal of work for RCA, which became BMG. Mm -hmm. um, I, along the way, I also did some uh, work for DECA and uh, for EMI. And uh, finally, uh, my partner, Scott Kessler, and I formed Marston Records in 1997. And we've been producing ever since then. Lotte Lehmann was born in Pellberg, Germany on the 27th of February, 1888, and died in Santa Barbara, California on the 26th of August, 1976. She made her professional debut in Hamburg in 1910. In 1916, she moved to Vienna. By then, she had already appeared at Covent Garden as Sophie and de Rosencavalier under Beecham in 1914. She remained in Vienna until 1938, making numerous guest appearances elsewhere, Covent Garden from 1924, when she sang her first Marshall in under Bruno Walter in America from 1930. From 1934 until her retirement from the stage in 1945, she was the mainstay of the Metropolitan Opera. She created leading roles in Strauss's De Frau in a Schatten and Intermezzo, and she also established herself as a singer of Lieder. After her final retirement in 1951, she devoted herself to teaching and writing. Her warm, generous voice, vivid personality, and fine musicianship made her an unforgettable artist, renowned not least for her Elsa and Sieglinde. I'm delighted to let you know that Ward will be returning to the Speaking Opera podcast on November 4th. Ward and I will discuss suggestions for ways in which one might approach listening to historical recordings. Topics to follow include other recordings that Ward has issued on Marston Records, brick and mortar stores and marketing recordings, and Geraldine Ferraro and how she impacted our early years by way of our grandfathers. Yes, Ward's and mine. This should be great fun.
Many thanks to you all for listening to our conversation today. If you have questions about Marston Records, you may go to their website at marstonrecords.com. Elsa's Dream was recorded on February 21st, 1930. The conductor is Frieder Weissmann with members of the Berlin State Opera Orchestra. Oh, 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 oh,